Hey there Sasquatch Chronicle fans, my name's Dave, I'm the bassist in a band called Fabric from the UK, or Fabrique for the purists, um, and I'm here to ask for your support, so many of you may not know but our big break really came when Wes played our song Black Lake at the end of um, one of the episodes of Sasquatch Chronicles. Um, I contacted Wes because I love that Pompeii tune and a lot of the stuff he plays. Moby Porcelain, um, his version of Oh, sometimes get a good feeling. That's good too. Um, but I'm here to ask for your support. Our second album is written, recorded, mixed, mastered. We've done all that stuff ourselves. However, to get it on CD and vinyl and distributed, we need to raise some cash, so um, I'm asking uh, my fellow Squatchers um, to pledge uh, on this crowdfunder. There are many different options that you can support us with a pledge, and hopefully it means that you'll be owning, um, before anyone else, on CD or vinyl or have a t-shirt, anything you want from the pledges. Um, but I really hope that you support us and I want to say thank you to all the people, all the Squatchers around the world who have supported us. It's been overwhelming the amount of people that have commented on our video and how far around the world we've actually been reaching. And it is all thanks to Wes and you listeners of Squatch Chronicles. So, stay Squatchy friends. Black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm gonna die out here. No one's ever gonna know. I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll, I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at a, at a rate that I, I I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me, and this look of I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was, he was, he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage all the way to the door. 911, what are you reporting? Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? Sure. Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. You're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Check us out online at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you've had an encounter, email me. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. That was Fabric, uh, the band Fabric, in the int before the intro. And I hope everyone goes out to support them. Uh, you can find them on Facebook. It's F-A-B-R-I-K. I know when I've said Fabric in the past, a lot of people type in F-A-B-R-I-C and can never find them. Uh, but it ends with a K. And you can find them on YouTube. You can find them on iTunes. A very cool band. They put together some really cool music. Uh, tonight I'll be playing White Star. It's a song called White Star. A very haunting tune. It's kind of like the Black Lake tune. It's very haunting. Uh, it kind of draws you in. And I, I love their music. I love all genres of music. Uh, good music. And I, I'm definitely a fan of the band Fabric. So if you get a chance, check them out. Hopefully we can go out and support them in their endeavors. 
Uh, tonight we'll be talking to Cliff, and Cliff comes to us from Louisiana, and he was very close to a creature, uh, not a Sasquatch, a uh, different type of creature, and he was within 13, 15 feet of this thing, and it stood up and turned around and looked at him. A uh, very scary account. We're also going to be welcoming to the show Russell Accord from the International Bigfoot Conference and the TV show Expedition Bigfoot. I'm really looking forward to the International Bigfoot Conference. I hope to see everyone out there. It's September 4th through the 6th in Kennewick, Washington. Uh, the International Bigfoot Conference. Can't wait for it. We'll be talking with him. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out SasquatchChronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Russ to the show, Russell Accord. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for being here. Hey, Wes. Thanks for having me, man. I, I love coming on your show. Yeah, well, I appreciate you being here. And uh, Russell Accord from the TV show Expedition Bigfoot. And I know you have the International Bigfoot Conference going on again this year. Uh, tell us about it. I'm glad it's coming back. It's one of my favorite conferences to attend. Oh, man, me too. It's been um, last year. Now that I can say what's going on last year, we weren't really, I wasn't able to do it because it was just too busy with schedule um, filming and then uh, trying to juggle everything in life. And then you have to do pickups, um, which means once you've done your filming, they want you to come back and pick up some of the things we might have left out or forgotten. So it was it was a busy year. But that's behind us. Uh, this year, I was able to, I know that I can handle just about anything that comes my way on schedule. So we went ahead and went forward with the IBC, and it's going to be freaking amazing. Yeah, I'm excited. I can't wait for it. Uh, it's one of the few conferences I really look forward to going to and, and meeting everyone and, and meeting new people. Um, I'm very excited to go. And I was kind of bummed out you didn't have it going on last year, but I understand that you were filming uh, your, the Expedition Bigfoot, uh, and congratulations on your success with Expedition Bigfoot. Uh, I wonder, hopefully there'll be a season two. Oh man, I, I hope that we're, the whole cast, I know we're all kind of hopeful that we get a season two, just for the fact that, um, getting back out there, getting in the woods, working with this, these, this group is just dynamic. You know, you've got Dr. Maria, who's just, um, she's a walking encyclopedia. I do enjoy working with her. Um, Ronnie and I, we have different perspectives, which I think you'll see that in the show, but he's great to work with. I mean, he's just enthusiastic and sticks with it. He just stays the course. And then Bryce, whenever we need something, he's got all the fancy gadgets or the connections to get the fancy gadgets to work with. So it was great being able to um, use uh, equipment that I normally wouldn't have been able to use and or afford. I mean, just some really, really great tech. So it just kind of took it to the whole new level, and I, I, what a blast! Yeah, hopefully there'll be a season two. I know the uh, the International Bigfoot Conference is what September fourth through the sixth, I believe. Uh, and correct that me is correct. Yeah, and, yep. and and for people coming out, let's say they're coming out for the first time, what what can they expect coming out to the IBC? Uh, things to expect. Um, it's Labor Day weekend, so it's already going to be a long weekend. You don't have to worry about getting the time off, you know, Monday, getting back home. So that's why I kind of chose that weekend. The venue is just incredible. Three Rivers Convention Center. We're in Kennewick, Washington. Um, the hotel is, there's hotels wrapped all the way around it. So it's, it, it's, everything's just all inclusive if, if you want to come out. Um, the lineup of speakers, I've tried to make it each year better and better and kind of increase the, uh, you know, the, the the people as far as intellect and everything else, we have Dr. Maria um, Mayer there and Dr. Jeff Meldrum there. We have, you know, just some some dynamic researchers. Bob Gimlin will be there as usual. He's He seems to be the guy, uh, the go-to guy for conferences. So he'll be there. And um, it's just, it's a Friday late afternoon to the evening it's all day saturday and then sunday morning till about lunchtime or so or a little after and there's presentations there's a vendor hall that is just chock full of really really amazing art and gifts and um an opportunity to meet all the speakers that way as well they all have their own vendor table so you can actually get up 
close and personal and meet Dr. Morea or meet Dr. Meldrum or, or any of the, the speakers that are there. And that's been kind of the highlight of a lot of people that come to the conference is I'm not, it's not for me. It's for the, for the crowd that come and let them get to meet the speakers. Cause there's some really, really amazing, you know, information and, and some good pedigree here. Yeah, I agree. And if you get a chance, go to the international bigfootconference.com. You can see the full lineup of speakers. And I'm glad, uh, I expected Bob would be there, but I'm glad to hear he's coming. Um, and you know, as well as I do, no one cares who you are or what you've done when Bob's around, which I love that. Uh, they're like out of the way, Bob Gimlin's over here. <laughs> yeah. You, no matter who you think you are, you vanish quick when Bob walks in the room, you know, doesn't, doesn't matter. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's amazing. Yeah, he yeah, is. I, I love having him there. So um, that should be a lot of fun. The, and what's really interesting about this is uh, the entire cast for the show, Expedition Bigfoot, Dr. Morea, RPG, um, Ronnie and Bryce, myself, we all have our own things that we um, come to conferences with. We're all authors or actors or podcasts or that sort of thing. So it's going to be that one time when the entire cast of Expedition Bigfoot is going to be right there and you have an opportunity to meet everyone and ask those questions. So pretty nice. It's, um, they'll, they'll, we'll all be there. And uh, if you look over the, the speakers list on international bigfoot conference.com, you can look at the, the get the uh, speakers, but then you can also look at the guests that are coming as well. I have some special guests that are pretty mind blowing as well. So a chance to meet people you wouldn't normally ever get to meet. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to hang out. And the Three Rivers uh, Convention Center, it's a beautiful uh, place for a conference. I've been to several conferences, and some of them great, mm -hmm. some of them not so great. But the International Bigfoot Conference has, it's never let me down. I always have fun when I'm there. It's relaxed. You get to kind of chill, meet new people, hang out. You know, I, I'm more or less in the vendor section, but... Uh, you know, if you want to hear presentations by researchers, investigators, uh, it pretty much has everything. You hang out with Bob Gimlin afterwards. The hotel rooms are beautiful. I stay right there. It's nice to go from the convention center right to the elevator and go right to your room. Um, is there any more? Yeah, you don't have to leave the building. Yeah, you don't even, you never have to leave. That's right. Um, is there any more VIP tickets for the VIP dinner? It looks like I was, I'm, I'm glad you asked because I'm actually was just looking through that. It looks like Saturday or uh, Friday is just about sold out. There are still a few left on Saturday. If you want to get a VIP ticket for Saturday, um, there's still a few available, but those are not going to last. Um, there's still vendor space available. I, in fact, if we run out of vendor space, I can. I have the entire three rivers convention center so i can always expand and make more room for vendors if they want to come in um this year is going to be an incredible crowd just because of the uh the dynamic group of speakers and special guests that i have i couldn't agree more can't wait to go i know we had one last thing on the agenda uh before we close it out i'll let you take it away russ i've started something here uh about a year ago and then it's just starting to pick up steam um, and I know you've seen it on the internet. It's called Corridor 13. Um, the number is 13 on Corridor 13 or Corridor13.com. And it's it has a lot to do with, like my International Bigfoot Conference, The um, when you're going to put on an event or a, uh, a show, a lot of times, you know, you want to have the best speakers or, or somebody that's going to draw a crowd. And I've started building a little crowd for uh, Corridor 13. It's basically a... A place where you can go select who you want to be at your conference um, we work it out of uh, the details of it and you get a chance to get some of these speakers or motivational speakers authors uh, there's a little bit to choose from there um, some really really great people on quarter 13 for anybody who's actually interested in doing an event of their own so that's something that I've been kind of tying into. I actually have Bob Gimlin on the roster for people that want to get Bob Gimlin to their event or Jim Vieira, or there's just uh, a great group of people. Um, I just picked up an author, um, Ronald Murphy, and I don't know if you've heard of him, but if you've ever seen uh, an author that can just, he's got some incredible material. 
he does some script writing for some networks. I mean, this guy's got a lot to to share. So you get a chance, check out the um, quarter13.com. It's actually pretty cool a way to get to get these people at your events. Well, definitely check it out. Corridor13.com. Russell Accord puts on the greatest conference ever in Kennewick, Washington, September 4th through the 6th. Uh, go to the internationalbigfootconference.com and uh, get your tickets. Come hang out. I'll be out there. A long list of people. I looked down the list of uh, speakers that Russ is having this year, and uh, it's a great, great group of. Uh, I'll, I'll probably have to break away to listen to some of the the speakers but uh russell i really appreciate coming on hey i appreciate it i appreciate you uh letting me talk about the the conference it's going to be a lot of fun this year um real quick question are you going to be playing cards this year because i never got a chance to sit at the table and play poker with you i'm still looking to take some of that money (laughs) i might i'll have to think about it i thought about dragging woody up this year to it um but you know last year was so i was so busy with um, you know, talking to people. I think I was end up talking to listeners that were telling me encounters, and I and I didn't get a chance to break away to do the poker, so I was kind of bummed out about that. I'd like to do it. Uh, let me think about it. I'd definitely like to do it. We had a lot of fun that one year we did it. Yes, sir. Let me know. I'll be ready. Well, I want to welcome uh, Cliff to the show. Cliff, thanks for coming on. Oh, man, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to finally talk to somebody about this. Yeah, I'm glad to have you on. Uh, I'm definitely glad to have you on. And I know you have had a couple of, uh, you had a very scary encounter down there in Louisiana uh, with uh, what we call a dog man. But I know there's other encounters we're going to talk about first. Uh, I'll let you take it away. Kind of tell us about these experiences. What were you doing? And walk us into what happened, if you were. Now, this is in Colorado, correct, Cliff? Now, yeah, yeah. As far as, yeah. Now, you know, me and my, me and my dad we and my brother and my mom, we all grew up, you know, hunting ever since we were, you know, little bitty things. And, you know, it, it always used to upset me because they always got to go, you know, because you got to be a certain age before you can go to Colorado and be able to hunt. And I, I think it's 15 or I think it's 15 or 16. And, and uh, I remember them leaving and, and going, you know, from when I was a little bit thing. They'd always be gone for about 10 10 to 12 days and you know we always had a babysitter there but but finally got old enough to go and i i guess it was about well i was 18 yeah i was 18 years old and we had left and and went to the san juan national forest there and uh i think all of us had a had a bull elk tag and then you know one of us would always get a a cow elk tag that way we you know try and get some meat you know somehow so but anyway we had we had separated and you know i'm sitting on this ridge and we had met some other people that were friends of my brothers because he was an olympic shooter at uh right there in colorado springs he was at the olympic training center and um so one i think it was one of his instructors or something and his friend they were there too and uh anyway i was just i was walking with my bow and, and walking down this ridge and directly to the west of where i was standing there was you know lots of dead trees through there uh you know standing dead trees and man all of a sudden i mean and, this was over the wind you know wind pretty much blows a lot in colorado i mean it's just it's a constant thing kind of like here in texas i mean it blows all the time so i'm walking and i had stopped and i was glassing and man all of a sudden i heard no it's not like a tree falling i mean this was a smash i mean it was like a huge tree smashing up against another one it's the best way i know how to explain it and it it kind of shocked me and i so i'm sitting there and i sit down and i'm listening you know i'm thinking the whole, the whole time and i'm not seeing it did never see anything but then i heard it again but it was a little bit further off this time real loud real loud and uh then a little bit while later like five minutes later i heard it again and uh don't know what it was not for sure but you know as time's gone on 
you know, I'm starting to realize these different places that we went and the different things that did happen, you know, I'm starting to wonder, you know, if that's not what it was. I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure now that I sit back and think about it. Yeah, there's always moments like that, especially for hunters, when you look, kind of look back at weird situations and go, oh, I wonder if that's what that was. But at the time, it's kind of confusing. Um, I would imagine yep. that that would have been loud, you know, a tree slamming into another tree. I mean, it sounded, yeah, I mean, it sounded, I mean, literally, man, like, I mean, somebody, I mean, there was no way that it was a natural tree fall. I mean, I've been hunting all my life. I've guided people. I've been guiding people for years and years, man. I take people hunting, I mean, all over. I mean, New Mexico, Colorado, Alaska, uh, and I know what trees sound like when they're falling. This was not what that was. Without a doubt, that's not what it was. But you know, when you when you're, when you're that young, and you, you know that just goes that that kind of thought doesn't come to your mind. I mean, you just don't think about stuff like that. Yeah, you're right. You know? But but now that I look back to several different places, the other place was up in Maker in Maker, Colorado. This this was the following year. I went up there. My mom was with us this time. It's me, my brother, and my dad. And uh, we all had tags. She had a mule deer tag. Matter of fact, she was the only one that got a mule deer. Uh, while we were there, she killed a big old nine point. But um, but we had separated there too. She went up and dropped us off, so, and we were going to go do a, a one day hike, stay the night, go a little bit, you know, further back where most people don't go. And it was kind of treacherous in a few places because. Because if we'd have fell from this one place, that we, it was probably like a 400 foot drop. I mean, ain't none of us would have made it. But there was no other way around. But we had been told by somebody else that there was lots of elk over that way. But anyway, we got across that, and, and we had separated over. This was the following morning because we had just enough time to get over there and set up camp. That night, you know, I had woke up because I was hearing something. It, something was walking. I was thinking it might have been a bear or something. And my dad was right beside me, and then my brother was on the other side of him. And I'm here. This is about two o'clock in the morning. And I reached over and grabbed my brother's foot, and I shook his foot, and I just pointed to my ear. I'm like, listen, listen. And it was something. Whatever it was was big and walking. But I was thinking, you know, I tell it was padded, that it wasn't, you know, hooked. There's a big difference. You, you can tell if you hunt it up, you can tell. And I'm like, what is that? And then it would stop. And then you hear it again a little bit later. Well, he just told me, forget about it. You know, he just went, just forget it. Whatever, you know, as long as it don't come in here. He was not worried about it. And I was like, okay. So I'm, anyway, went back to sleep. But. Anyway, we had separated the, the next morning again. You know, we split up, and we had the little walkie-talkies that, you know, the 15-milers, the Motorola, that way we could stay in touch or even, you know, keep an idea where each of us is at. And um, same thing, man. I'm down by a creek, and uh, the creek went down and took a 90-degree took a turn, and I had went right there, and I'm looking at a whole bunch of fresh sign on the ground. And I, same thing. I was hearing a bunch of breaking up in the, it was, you know, up from me, probably several hundred yards up the slope from me. I don't know what it was, but I heard that two different times, like within a 10 minute span. And uh, that's pretty much it. I never, never, saw anything or anything like that but it, what was odd about that place even though all the sign was there we never saw anything we never saw anything on that side of the mountain dad and them never saw a mule deer we never saw anything and usually you could see there's all sorts of stuff up there i mean that's wild country up there now and but when we got back on the other side, after we came back the next morning, then the snow came that night. It snowed one foot overnight. I remember waking up having to rake the snow off the top of the tent. 
And that's when mom come woke me up and she went, you want to go with me? And I was so cold and tired from the day before. I was like, oh, mom, I'm not going to, well, I'm going to go out here a couple hundred yards. And that's when she went out and killed that nine points, killed five or four mule deer. I was like, boy, honey, boy. <laughs> so, but everything was, uh, you know, most of the animals were on that side. Um, it was just kind of strange, you know, being over there and, and, and not seeing anything. I mean, there was lots of fresh sign, but there was nothing or none of us, me and my brother and my dad, never saw anything. How many years later was it when you were in Louisiana and you saw the Luke DeRue? Oh, six the- years. This has been it's almost the six, six year, almost the six year. Six years later? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Was, yeah. Tell, tell us about it. What, what were you doing and what, what happened? <laughs> okay. You know, I've been, you know, my dad's been, like I say, he's been taking us hunting ever since we were little bitty. I remember going over across the street and it's, it was, it's the, what they call the Ted Wolf property. And it's directly across the driveway from my dad's house. I mean, that's where he started us off squirrel hunting and uh, a little bit of deer hunting, mainly squirrel hunting. And, uh, but I'd been deer hunting. I took it to a whole nother level. That's the only time that, the family would ever do any hunting together. Dad and my brother never did any hunting uh, in Louisiana as far as deer hunting or anything. I mean, rarely. I mean, my dad might have went a couple times, you know, but but I was really into it. I mean, I was, if, if it was daylight, Cliff Humphreys was in the woods. I mean, if I had time enough to get off work and get to the woods, Everybody knew that's where I was. If it was daylight, that's where I was at. But I got up this morning, and my sister had told me uh, a couple of days prior to that she'd like to have some deer meat. And I said, okay, I'll go across the street and get, get you one. And she was like, well, it ain't that easy. I said, yeah, it's that easy. There ain't nothing to it. Because I know where they lay up over. I've been over there a thousand times. And every time, I mean, there's like four or five different spots over there that I could go. And I know where they're laying at. And there's a certain way. If you just keep keep walking and don't stop, and right before you get to where they're laying up, and you stop and shuffling your feet, they're jumping up. It's the white tail. They're jumping up and, and getting it. I mean, so that's how I always shot them. But I got up this morning, and this has happened to me four or five times before, and it is strange. I can't even, it's beyond strange. But I get up, and I walk across the street, and the first thing that I noticed when I stepped over there was it was totally quiet. And when I mean totally quiet, I mean you could have heard a pin hit the leaves i mean it was that quiet like being in a vacuum and i mean not a cricket not a bird nothing i mean that's that's happened to him like i say four or five times before and i was like well and i mean is this something you notice right off the bat if you've, if you've ever done much much hunting if you've got a career long hunter uh i'm sure they probably seen this once or twice in their lifetime but they really got to be out there a lot so I went on hunting and I wasn't going to be in a stand, you know, over there this time. So I was just, I was sneaking. I was taking my time. And there's a creek that cuts across in a, and it joins another property. It, it comes over from where the, there's a big canal that runs right there. But then you got this creek that cuts from that side, which is the south, south side of the property, and cuts over to the northeast corner of the property and goes on to what's called the Babs property. And anyway, so I'm walking along that that creek, and the creek's probably I don't know knee deep. But there's two two old cedar trees or cypress trees that's been over there as far back as I remember. I mean, my dad said when he was a kid, he used to shoot buzzards out of them. You know, when when he's a youngster, because he grew up right there, just a block away from my grandmother, and he grew up. And well, both of those trees. I mean, when I mean huge, I mean they're they're seven foot across and uh but both of them had fallen during this real bad storm we had a tornado that came through there uh it's been one of the only ones that came that that close but it came to there and well they knocked both of these trees down well they're probably four foot up off the ground you know 
and they're laying side by side, probably 10 foot apart. And I had eased up to the, the back side of one of them there was fixing to walk down the edge of it. And man, I caught a whiff of something. I'm like, my God, what is that smell? So I'm trying to figure out what this smell is. That's when all of a sudden I heard this, it was a rumbling. I don't know if it was a growl or a, a, a moan. It's, it's kind of hard to explain, but it was, it was strong enough that I could feel it in my feet. You know, I could feel it through the ground, and I'm like, he is that? And, it, I mean, it's it's just rumbling, and then it'll stop for a second, and then it's starting back. So I'm, I was there about 30 seconds trying to figure out where this is coming from, and about that time, there's a swamp rabbit to my left that was about five or six feet away from me that took off. And I don't know if other people have heard this. They probably have. They've hunted enough. But they make a certain sound when they're, they're spooked and they take off running. And uh, anyway, he took off running. And when he took off running, or actually, let me go back. I'm wrong here. As I'm hearing the rumbling, he stepped up. That's when it stood up in front of me on the other side of these trees. I mean, totally black. But I mean, as soon as that happened, when he, when he stood up in front of me, and I'm looking, that's when the rabbit took off to my left. And that's when he turned around and looked at, buddy, when I'm telling you massive, I cannot, I can't even, it's hard to me to even explain to you how big, I mean, v back. I mean, monstrous, I mean, muscles bounding. <laughs> But when that rabbit took off, that's when he turned around to cause the sound of that rabbit. I can't believe he didn't hear me when I was walking, but I was slipping. I was really slipping. And that's when he turned around and spotted me. And when he spotted me, he laid his ears back. Now, I've grown up around horses all my life. I've trained them and cows. That was my chores as a, as a kid. I mean, putting out hay and, and training horses and dealing with cows and stuff. I mean, all the time. When he laid his ears back, I knew right then that's not good. So I'd raise my weapon. As soon as I raised my weapon, I fixed to shoot him right, right in the face. As soon as I raised my weapon, he took one leap, Wes, and I can't stress this to you either. I mean, I really don't care if anybody blazed me or not, but I'm telling you, he took one leap straight away from me and covered, I don't know, 20 something foot. And when he hit the ground, took off to my right. And this is something else is just beyond all fit. I, I can't even stress to you the speed, the speed that he took off in. I can only compare it to a cheetah. That is my best way. I can only compare it to a cheetah. And yeah, he took wanna... off on all fours, and right before he hit that, he, he's coming around to my right. So I thought it was fixing to come in behind me. Well, there's a honeysuckle thicket, and it's the honeysuckle thicket's only about ten foot wide. So I had got turned around, and I said, "When he comes out that other side, I'm I'm gonna try and you know get him." When he hit the honeysuckle thicket. I mean, going that fast, I don't even, I don't even know how to tell you how fast, man. I mean, 50 miles an hour, 40, 50 miles an hour. I mean, I'm telling you, that's how fast he was going. And I, when he hit the honeysuckle ticket, he didn't come out the other side. And there ain't no way possible, only on a 10 foot wide honeysuckle ticket, that that sun gun going that fast could have not come out the other side. I mean, when he hit the honeysuckle ticket, it was like he disappeared. When I mean, when the back of him went into the honeysuckle ticket, he never come out the other side. And then right at that moment is when I started backing out of there. I didn't know what was going on because what I just seen ain't supposed to be real. <laughs> and I'm questioning many things, and I am scared, slapped to death, man. I mean, I, I, the amount of fear, I can't even stress to you either. I backed my way out of there and uh, super aware of everything that was going on. I mean, I was already like that anyway. Man. I grew up like that. I mean, but, you know, I was really 
really aware of everything and i mean i just started backing in i backed my way out i'm probably i was probably 350 400 yards from you know the end of my driveway one of the questions i wanted to ask you was how far away from you was this thing and would you describe for the audience what you saw man he was 13 14 feet from me that's i mean maximum 13 14 feet literally 13 14 feet from me i mean it that close i mean you don't mistake anything that close i'm sorry wes i mean i'm I'm a sane guy and i know what i saw and what i saw was just like what's on these movies uh that's been coming out here lately uh like the underworld you can call it a dog man you can call it a werewolf you can call it whatever but uh, i can tell you uh, that's what it was just like you see on the on the movie i mean exactly i wasn't smoking anything i wasn't drinking i don't drink i don't do anything man i was straight up that's what i saw it was massive man i, I can't even stress to you the size but when it is 40 i mean totally black i mean black coal black and except for on his muzzle when he turned around and looked, and he had some white light streaks down the side of his muzzle. And man, and the canines on this dude was, I don't know, man, three, three inches long, uh, two, two inches at least, two and a half inches. And I mean, when he laid his ears back, that right there let me know, I mean, from growing up around horses anytime they do that it's just one thing you know when they do that you're fixing to have a problem and but it was like he knew that's what i can't understand either it was like he knew what that weapon was it's like he just knew what that weapon was because when i picked it i had a seven mag with me i mean when i picked up that seven mag uh it was like he instantly knew and i mean he jumped away immediately and I mean, the big had the big, big calves, man, the muscle. I mean, monstrous legs on him. Uh, there was no tail or anything like that, or you know, not that I saw. But I'm talking about canine bottoms from his knee down. I mean, no question what I saw, man. There's no question. And but anyway, the speed. That's the other thing that I, I can't. This is hard for me to stress to you this, how fast, how fast it took off. I mean. Yeah, and I get reports uh, of them taking off like that. Even even Sasquatch, there's reports of them chasing cars and keeping up with cars doing 50 miles an hour. Um, and it's you know, just, that's, that's, hard, that's hard to fathom. I it mean, is, yeah. Whatever, whatever this is or whatever is going on right now, you know, and I'm a pretty – I'm a biblical dude, brother. And if it's one thing that I have studied for 30 years, it, it's the scripture. My personal opinion is all this is in scripture about all this stuff that people are seeing. But it disturbed me so bad of what I had. Well, I can't, I can't even stress to you, brother. I mean, it bothers me now, you know what I mean? Because this shit ain't natural. This is not natural. Not natural. So when he turned and looked at you, I'm assuming he showed you his teeth, uh, as you would describe well, them. Well, I mean, his, I mean, his mouth was partially open, and uh, he had something out the corner of his mouth. I don't know what it was. Uh, I don't know if he was eating on something or there was something in his mouth. I couldn't. You know, this happened in, in just seconds. You know, I'm, I'm telling you, all what I saw was in as far as him in front of me and me a visual on him and my reaction to his reaction was three to four seconds okay so it was probably more like three when he stood up cliff how tall do you think he was i can tell you this the tree that those two trees i told you is laying down he's standing right directly up against the second one okay he is his waist was a foot and a half above that okay and i know i'm really looking really looking up when he stood up i'm saying close to nine feet in between eight and nine foot i would say more than eight foot but not beyond nine that 
I cannot describe to you, man, the size. I mean, I really can't. I mean, it's beyond words. <laughs> yeah, I get it, man. I get it. I would have been scared, too. You know, how, how did this affect you? And did you did you tell anyone, Cliff? How did it affect me? <laughs> well, I'll put it this way. My family, my entire family, my wife, my kids, everybody in my family knew automatically that there was something wrong. I mean, I wasn't acting the same. I couldn't hardly sleep at night. I'm pacing. I'm having nightmares beyond nightmares. Um, you know, my dad's, you know, my dad used to chew me out and, and you know, cause I worked with him 20 something years of my life. Okay. Construction work, heavy equipment operator by trade is what I do. Except for winter months, I just want to do the guiding. He said, what in the hell is going on with you, son? He said, because any, if it's daylight hours, you're in the woods. Now he used to chew me out and go, son, there's more important things in this world than hunting. Well, it had totally turned around because I wouldn't even go back to the woods. Alan, I got one buddy that I've been hunting with all my life, too. Anytime we were off, we were gone hunting, okay? Hey, I wouldn't even go with him. I mean, I was closed off from everything and in my room. Uh, couldn't keep concentrated at work. I mean, everybody was asking People at church, people all around were asking, you know, what is going on? And I can't, no way I could tell them. And no, it was four years before I could ever say anything to anybody, even my best buddy that I've been hunting with all my life, my best friend still to this day. I mean, I finally said something to him and my mom. My mom was actually the first person that I said anything to. And I said, Mama, please listen to me. And I said, and do not tell my brother, you know, or dad. And I said, but I'm going to tell you because me and her are pretty close. Me and my dad are close, too. I mean, I, our whole family's tight, brother. I mean, super tight. But that was just something that I knew was not going to be good when I brought it up. And the first thing my mama said, she said, well, son, what do you think it was? I said, Mama, all I can tell you this is, without a shadow of a doubt, it's an abomination of this world. It was 100% evil is the best way I know how to explain it to you, Mom. That's my, she said, do you think you saw the devil? I said, I don't know if it's the devil, but I can tell you it was a, something off of him. I said, because that right there ain't supposed to be real i said you know and i mean i can't hardly talk to her when i'm sitting here telling her because i'm breaking down i mean i'm breaking down but, you know finally getting this load that's been on my back for so long off of me anyway it ended up getting around to my brother and them and it wasn't good just like i thought it was gonna be and um you know they're all y'all your own drugs and all. i mean I, I knew that's what was gonna be coming i knew that's what was so, you know, I never, I never spoke about it with any of them again, but they spread it throughout my family. I mean, to my granny and all them, you know, I mean, I should have never said nothing, but. Yeah, there's, there's a long history of it though there, Cliff, uh, in Louisiana. Oh, I know it is. I know it is as far as scripture. There's a long history of it. A long history of it. And speaks of these very times right here. Man, this I can tell you this with a, with a certainty. It's my personal opinion as far as what Scripture says. This is going to continue, and it's going to get worse, Wes. There's going to be more people seeing these things. It's going to continue, and it's going to escalate to the point of what our government does know is out there. They ain't going to be able to contain this much longer. It's starting to come out now. And all these things are fixing to come to a head for too long. They really are. That's my personal opinion. Yeah, I hear you. Know, you. I respect I that. I think it. I think it's you know. I don't deviate from scripture. Right? It's one thing I have studied all my life, and I can tell you, it, it even says in there about men's hearts failing, in fear of what's coming up on the earth. Now that means like. If people don't understand and, and start to really study and get in this background when the, some people that are clueless about this or 
or atheists or whatever or don't believe in any of this stuff when they see it. I mean, Scripture says they're literally going to have a heart attack. And that's what it says amongst many other things. You know, and I truly believe that they are, as far as Scripture goes, I still think they're part of the the fallen angels and all that. that but that bred with human women, I mean, you can't hardly get, you know, preachers nowadays to even want to go to the Old Testament and understand any of it. Uh, they won't preach about it. And I think that's what it's going to take, you know, the boldness behind the pulpit. And, man, that's what I try and do. Now, you know, and it's affecting me. You talk about affecting me as far as work. Once that buddy of mine that I was talking to you previously, you know, or, or yesterday about that was in the military for so long, and he was in the scientific and the and the intelligence part of it, and the team that he was on, the stuff that he had told me, man, in them woods, <laughs> it's, it's mind-blowing. And uh, that's what I mean. They they know what it is. They know what's 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 there, and uh, they ain't gonna be able to contain it too much longer. It's gonna come out. It's truly gonna come out. Would you put Sasquatch in that same category as Dogman? I know you're basically. I put all of it. I put all of it in the same category. Kind I of put a... all of that. Yes, that's all. It... Wes, scripture. I'm telling you, it's that all of these things are from way back. You know, another thing I don't think people understand is the people before us, just say 2,000 years ago, okay, those people were actually smarter than we are. Now, I know we've gone from horse and buggy to vehicles and flight within the past, what, 120 years. You know, for that to happen in that short amount of time, uh, when it's horse and buggy for the other 1900 before that and previous before that. Uh, but I think those people were smart. I think as we, as we keep going and we keep having children and children on their children, I think our, as far as our DNA goes, it's like taking a copy of a copy of a copy off of a copying machine. I think we're getting not as smart as those people were back then. And that's my personal opinion. But I know knowledge, and you know, scripture talk about knowledge increasing, and uh, and it says in there, my people will be will die because, from the lack of knowledge. But anything you want to know now is at your fingertips. Pretty much anything in this world that you want to know about is at your fingertips. I've often wondered about technology too. What made the last you know 120, 130 years so special to where? You know, like you said, we go from riding horses. Now we're riding cars. and Well, I can tell you, and I don't mean to cut you off, but I can, as far as that, what that buddy of mine told me that was in the military, back in 1950-something, we had a meeting with these so-called uh, aliens or whatever, and everything's exploded since then. Now, that's what he told me, and he said for exchange of technology their their request was to take take some of us and he's and the deal was you bring them back the way you took them and that was the deal <clears throat> for their technology to be you know given to us they wanted to take a few people and do experiments their own but they had to come back just like that, that was but they broke that right off the bat now this is what he's telling me now i'm just telling you what what he was telling me and now that's what he said and that kind of makes me wonder you know everything has exploded like majorly since that time and now if it's true i don't know but uh, i mean the boy wouldn't lie to me and he really trusts me beyond anybody else because we were best of buddies before he left for the military and uh he was there almost 30 years, and I mean, he came straight from the base to me, was white as a sheet, scared, said he wanted to talk to me, and uh, wanted to leave cell phones and all that at home, and he wanted me to take him to the woods, and for 27 hours, that's what I sat and listened. Before I even told him, you know, any of this other stuff that I've told him, you know, 
lately because he's staying he's 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 staying out of contact i hadn't talked to him since and uh but i know that's what he told me and and many many other things about stuff that, that's that's going on and it's really plagued me and i can tell you why how it's plagued me work-wise it has plagued me talking to that man because i brought up something maybe that i sh- shouldn't have brought up you know kind of about this topic and many jobs that i have went to where they were enthusiastic to have me i mean i went to the job told man how much experience i had operating equipment they're like you be here in the morning what they told me and uh we'll get you we'll get you to work i'd show up the next morning to the same guy that was itching to have me and words out of his mouth i'm sorry can't help you mr Humphries. i'm like what totally opposite from what he told me now this has happened to me four times now this has all been this has all happened to me within the past four years i was in oregon i was up in oregon up there and came here to texas the same thing and uh you know now, why are they it's, calling? Why are they calling you off of it, Cliff? Is it since you talked to this guy, or is there something happening? Uh, I guess I'm confused. Yeah, why? I, well, I mean, so, yes, this all happened since I talked to him, and I just I happened to be in a certain place, and and I didn't know the high level of people that was there that were kind of listening to what was going on, and I think I just said something I shouldn't have said because I had a, a plain clothes. Uh, guy come up to me that i could tell was you know something military or or something and uh told me that if i opened my mouth about this specific thing that i had opened my mouth up about that i was going to end up in a cmu and i'd never see the light of day again and that scared me and that was here in texas that happened just here not long ago and i've been having a hard time finding work uh, ever since then because I mean that's happened to me four different times about going to these jobs and they tell me oh man we, we ain't got nobody got that much experience and when I come back it's sorry can't help you Mr. Humphries three of them said that back word for word so I mean it's really it's really plaguing me this whole situation and uh, but I come here for mission work and I'm having you know I'm working with the church over here and everything about that uh and you know helping people with scripture and stuff but i hardly i rarely i hadn't said anything to very many people about this you know about what i'm talking to you about and uh because i'm afraid to bring it up too much more because i mean it's really it's really hurting man i mean well and for the audience who might be lost in this conversation because you didn't go into it and you don't really have to go into it I've, i've talked about some of the things you've talked about and some of the things uh, your friend told you that uh, works for the government or was in the military. I know to be true. Some of the comments he made to you, I've never talked about. Um, and I was kind of surprised when he said some of the things, but you kind of have to be careful with, with people like that because, uh, a, they shouldn't be talking and B, if you, well, get... it was bothering him so bad. I yeah. mean, and no, he I trusted hear. me and I know that. And, and I really do know that. I understand that. But it was bothering the boy so bad, he had to get it off of him just like I had to get this off of me, you know, because yeah. talking about it, really talking about it really unloads a major load off of you, brother. I mean, it, it really does. I mean, to keep it bottled up, it's not good. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. I hear you. Um, and I don't mean it in a derogatory way. I just mean you got to kind of be careful, you know, with with sometimes with information and, and I, I'm more or less speaking to him because you're, you're just a bystander. Well, I'll put it, I'll put it to you this way. And, and I need to need to say this because maybe you'll understand it a little more than I do. You know, I'm super tight with my, my family, brother, I, my mom, my granny, and both of my aunts have passed away in the past 20 months. Okay. Now I've had a super tough time dealing with that too but what really hurt me was i was talking to my dad and this was his comment to me 
He says, son, I don't want you back around here. And because he said, I don't want you back around the house. And he said, I'm sorry, but you have dropped the ball. You have dropped the ball. Now, whatever that means, I don't know. I have sat and pondered on that a many an hour. But he said, you have dropped the ball. You have dropped the ball. Yeah, I wonder what he meant. I don't know. And I've tried to get him to talk about it, and he he don't, he don't want to talk about it. I mean, he don't want to talk about it. And uh, but that that's what that was his comment to me. You have dropped the ball, son. You know, and, and uh, just several other things that's happened throughout my life. Uh, I mean, I and I need to share this with you if I can, if you don't mind. Yeah, take your time. <laughs> okay. This happened when I was, okay, 11 years old. This was September 26th, 1982. My mom, my, my dad's mother was dying of pancreatic cancer. Okay, that's where my daddy grew up, just just a block away from the house, out in the middle of nowhere, okay? It was all us grown-ups. I mean, all the grown-ups, and then there was 24 of us grandchildren. Well, she saw all the grown-up people first, and then she saw all the grandchildren last. I was the last grandchild to go in and see her, and this is what she said. When I walked in that door, this is what she said to me. She said, my baby, she said, she said, baby, I, she said, I got to go. And I said, what do you mean, Grandma? She went, well, Jesus come sat on the end of my bed just a little while ago and told me I needed to say my goodbyes. And uh, she said, you don't see those two angels standing right there? And I looked over and I said, no, Grandma, I don't see them. She said, you don't see those two angels standing right there? She said, their head's about to go to the ceiling. I said, no, Grandma, I don't see them. She went, well, they're waiting to take me. And she said, I just want to let you know I love you. And she said, and I'll see you later. When I walked out of that room, it was that quick. She was gone. Okay. Now, about a month later, and these are four dreams that I've had in my lifetime, but they're not like normal dreams. I, they're like real life. Okay. About a month later, I had a dream about this giant now i'm in my bedroom i'm in bring i'm in my house and i'm looking out the window and this it's a giant i mean all i can say it was a, a giant a true giant he was kneel he kneeled down and was looking under the roof the eve of the looking at me and stood up and started walking toward my mom and dad room which was on the other end of the house well i jumped up and took off down the hall and went in their room well the, their bed is backed up against that it's a triple pane window, okay? I mean, a triple window. You got the, the one big one in the middle and the two side ones on the end. And, and they had both sat up in the bed and was looking at me, and he was standing right behind them, kneeled down, looking through the back of that window. And I'm pointing. I'm, I can't speak. I'm, I'm not able to speak. I'm pointing like I'm trying to tell them what I'm seeing. And he reached both hands, he would reach toward the window and went to reach in to grab them. And I woke up. Scared me to death. All right. Now I'm in my 20s, go about 10 years ahead of that. I had the same kind of dream with another giant. I'm in the mountains hunting. And I remember walking over, it was me and a buddy of mine. And we're walking and we went to go walk. And, hear this other giant come walking up the, and I mean, I mean, huge brother. I mean, like 30 foot tall, 20 something foot tall. And I remember saying in the name of Jesus, I was pointing at him and I remember knocking him back. Okay. Then I woke up again. I that dream. That's how quick that one was. Then I'm about 36 years old, had another dream of the same situation. I was in the mountains again in a different place, a place that I've hunted before. And here comes another one. And I did the same thing. And he went away. 
Now, just six months ago, I had one, and it was basically the same thing, but it was a giant wolf and when i'm and i'm telling you not like a normal wolf this wolf was like a lion but his mane was out of feathers okay little feathers but it went all the way down and in between his front legs me and my buddy had just killed a deer and drug it we we're in the woods just drug this white tail up to this creek where it made a little s turn and we were taking a break and that's when I looked in front of me. I didn't see him in my dream, but I knew he was, you know, to my left as far as in my dream. And I was looking, I see this giant wolf coming. He gets in the creek, swims across the creek, comes up on this side, grabs the deer by the back of the neck. And this is how big he is. A deer stretched out is about from seven to eight feet from from nose to the with their legs hanging down to their hooves. That's about how long they are, okay? I'm trying to give you an instant how big this thing was. When he bit him on the back of the neck and picked it up, his feet was dangling off the ground about six or eight inches. I mean, that's how tall his, that's how tall he was. I mean, monstrous. He jumped back in the creek, swam back across, got up on the other side, and as soon as he got up on the other side, why I did this, I don't know. But I had my rifle in my hand, and as soon as he got up on the creek on the other side, I hollered at him, hey! And I can't stress to you, I cannot stress to you, how fast he turned and looked at me with that deer hanging in his mouth. It was like a, a millisecond. I mean, when I went, hey, it was like, poof, and he was looking right at me. And I grabbed my gun, and he turned and looked back where he had had come from on this side of the creek. And when I turned and looked, I saw seven more of them coming up over the spoil bank, coming at me, same size as he was. And that's when I woke up. Now, that's what happened to me when my grandmother, that was real, you know what I mean? But these dreams are not like normal dreams, and I've had them in 10 year spans almost, you know? What do you think the dreams mean? <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't know. I, I really, I've, I've, I've wondered about that. It's thing, I think it's things to come because in the dream with the wolf, the wolf one, I knew in that dream somehow it, I knew it was after things had done went really bad and it was like having to live out in the mountains away from whatever had went on. In that dream, it was like I knew something bad had done happen worldwide. Okay, I knew that. Oh, I gotcha. I gotcha. So, so I have no idea. But why it's always been? It was three giants, sure enough, giants as far as giants go in the first three. But then it was a giant wolf. I mean, but beyond a wolf, it was like a mane. I mean, he had a mane like a like a lion, but it was out of feathers. You know, little short white feathers. So I don't know, Wes. Yeah, I hear I you. I don't know. I hear it's disturbing to have dreams like that. You know, and I didn't mean to come down on you earlier. I've talked to um, people who claim to be in the military, and they, they say very similar things, how there's frequency weapons they use to bring them in. and um, I mean, That's exactly what I was told. Yeah, and they'll tell you all sorts of things. And uh, when I used to get information like that, I wasn't sure if it was true or not, but I actually heard it several times over. And um, I know when I started to really kind of go into the government cover up and uh, talk about some of these things, I get weird phone calls. People tell me, you know, un unavailable numbers and threatening phone calls. And uh, the hey, listen, listen, I, I just thought of something. I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, my God. I have got to tell you this. This is what he told me as far as the big feet go and the ones that are beyond the big feet. He told me there's some that are not Bigfoot, but they're 14 to 18 foot tall or something like that. These are all club carrying. I mean, they always got some kind of weapon. This is what he told me. This blew my mind, but it makes me think about many things that's happened to these different people. He told me their cerebral strength, their mind strength is beyond what we can even fathom. He said their cerebral strength 
is crazy. He said the bigger they are, the more cerebral strength they have. And he said they are literally able to do whatever they want to. And this swaying, because, you know, when, when he was mentioning this, I'd already heard this from some other people back when they're sitting there swaying back and forth. They are sending some kind of, some kind of mental signal to a specific person or, or whoever, that makes me wonder about the many things that I've heard. Many people have said that they've seen that, but he said that that is one aspect of them that is unbelievable. It's the cerebral strength of them. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, even the Nephilim, if you read some of the ancient writings, that was where they got you was with, um, anyway, and let's hope he's full of crap. And <laughs> it makes me feel better thinking that maybe he's full of crap. He may not be, though. That's a problem. No, I can tell you this. I mean, the the boys, yeah, I grew up with him, man, and he, he, the boy wouldn't lie, man. That's all I know. And, I mean, that's what's really I – mean, the boy would not lie to save his life. I mean, he really wouldn't. And that, all that stuff that he told me, man, is, you know, I'm starting to see now. You know, a lot of the stuff that he's talking about, I'm starting to really see. It's it's, it's yeah. something. And I didn't mean it like that, Cliff. I didn't mean he's a liar. I oh, just I mean I, I, it made me feel better just, you know, assuming he's full of it. Because if you really if it's true, it's more terrifying than what anyone really thought it was. And there's a lot of things. I mean, even with Sasquatch, you're and I've said this before, Cliff, your average person that runs into a Sasquatch dogman's a little different story. Uh, most people run into dogman will say it's evil and that there it was not there's something not right about it. Um, no, man. No. But but I think your average person that runs into a Sasquatch sees an animal. They see a um a Neanderthal or they see a monkey, not so much a monkey, more like he an told me. And that's the other thing. You don't mean to cut you off again. He told me without, with a certainty, there is nothing ape about them. No, nothing is ape about them whatsoever. Whatsoever. Yeah. And I tend to agree with that. I, I he think he told me, he told me that they're part, the ones of old, he's, and I don't know what he means. I'm maybe the ones that he was talking about of old are the ones, uh, you know, that uh, were of the original, uh, as far as like scripture goes. What's there now, as far as what he was telling me, has been amped up and mixed. DNA wise, and that's he said that's been going on for a long, long time. And he said, but it has got to a a science now that is they can do anything. And he said, there's lots of people going to be starting to see lots of things. I mean, he's still telling me some stuff, especially native people. I got native people in my family. I have I got I'm part. I got a piece of Hopi Indian in me. Okay. I had a cousin that went and lived with him for four years and wrote a book on him. Jerry Grider was his name. And, you know, some of the things that, that he he even said, you know, that my mom had actually shared with me when I was telling her about what I'd seen. She had told me about, you know, him being over there and what they had told him about the, about the, the Bigfoot. And that the, they stay away from certain areas of the reservation, you know, that's that's their area, as he put it. I mean, it, you know, and I don't know, man, it's just things going on in this world that's 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 coming out more and more now. And it's a, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing uh, because, you know, people need to be aware of these things. It's just, you can't just go talk to an average person, Joe walking down the street, brother, and, and, and help them understand that. But I try to do that scripturally, man, and help them understand, you know, it was all that was supernatural. So there's lots of supernatural stuff going on. And I think as we grow and there's more and more people on this earth and we are encroaching more and more people going to these national parks, and barst and, and other places it's inevitable, inevitable that you're going to run into this 
I mean, that's my opinion. Why there's more and more that, and you know, scripture talks about the thinning of the veil, you know, and I just think these things are, that's what's happening. That's what's happening. Yeah. Hopefully it's not things to come. I tend to agree with you though. I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. And I think that there will be more encounters. Um, I think the, the part that terrifies me a little bit is I would love to believe that it's a primate, you know, just an animal we haven't caught up with. And the longer I've been in this, I can tell you, I know that's not to be true. There is. No, the DNA, as far as the DNA that's been done with several different people, Melba catch them doing that for, for, for David, another guy there I know that submitted a sample, uh, who somebody else came back. It came back. The mitochondrial came back as one was native American woman. Go figure that. Other one came back as a European woman, but the father was unknown in the DNA bank. The worldwide DNA bank, they cannot find the match for. So that's why I go straight to Scripture, and, and, and I just think that's what it is. I'm fairly certain that's what it is. It's just what it points to. That's what it points to. Yeah, and you could be how right. could it be? How could it be in the DNA bank? It can't be. Unknown father on both of them. Yeah, I don't know, stuff, Wes. Man. It's terrifying <laughs> stuff. But I appreciate. Uh, I pr- enjoy talking with you, Cliff. I appreciate you taking yeah. the time to come on and share your dogman encounter. And your, you, I guess that's the best name for it. But uh, I have uh, down where you're at. I've actually had a couple dogman shows I've done in that area where with people like yourself who've been hunting their whole life. Even a professional game hunter, I had on the show one time um he was on the the border of louisiana and he described very close to what you described um and when he was pointing his gun at it he said it took off on two legs and it was the fastest thing he's ever seen and it was just an upright wolf and he said but there was something very odd about it something wasn't right about it so demonic man my best way to put it i mean unnatural as unnatural can be uh, I mean, that's my best way to explain it to you. I mean, I know there's lots of people out there who may not believe this kind of stuff, man, but I'm telling you, you know, you don't mistake anything at 13 feet. I'm sorry. Uh, you just don't. <laughs> uh, so no, I, I don't, I don't know, brother. Um, Again, I appreciate you coming on, Cliff. It, uh, I enjoy talking with you. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, I, yeah, I enjoy talking with you, brother. I'm sorry about all the noise around me, but. No, that's all right. You got a family, I understand. Yeah. All right. You take care of yourself. All right. You too, sir. I thank you. Thanks, Cliff. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Going to close out with uh, Fabric and the song White Star. Until next time, everyone. <laughs>